Hey, this is Matt Cox, and this is The Grind. The way I live my life right now is based on stuff that I heard in prison. I was being held in a marshal's holdover, and I was held in a lot of marshal's holdovers. You know, they move you around. Like, I got caught in Tennessee, and they have to, they have to move you throughout like through a couple states and then they have to fly you to Oklahoma City and then they have to fly you like to Georgia which is where I was prosecuted out of in Atlanta is here so I was moved around quite a bit initially visually I, I ended up in a place one place for like five months one place for like four or five months I remember being locked up and I was when I first got locked up and I was talking to this guy and I remember the guy had horns on his head he was a white guy with horns on his head and I was in a I was in a pod that had whatever it was for 30 guys, 40 guys, I forget what it was, but almost all of them were Mexican and black. There was only two white guys, me and the guy with the horns on, on his head. And he'd done like 15 years in the state and was now got, had to do a couple years in the feds and then was getting out. And so I was sitting there and I said, I don't think I can do this. I mean, I, I really don't think I can do this. And he said, he looked at me and he goes, well, you don't have to do it. Now I looked and I went, what do you mean? He goes, he said, they're going to make you do it. He goes, it's really effortless on your part. He goes, all you got to do is follow the rules and keep yourself entertained until it's over. And I went, I remember thinking, that's a horrible thing to say. And I was like, what? And he goes, he said, yeah. He said, yeah. He goes, this is, what, this is it. They're going to force you to do the time. You have to keep yourself entertained. And he said, 80 to 90% of my time is just keeping myself entertained until it's over. And, and this is a guy who went to the state. I want to say he went to, where did he go to the state at that point? He went to like Kentucky or something. I was being housed in Kentucky. So he had gone, he'd done a bunch of state time. In the prison he was at, these guys are stabbing each other. Like he said like every couple of days somebody's dying. And, he, and that's why he got the horns tattooed on his head. He had all kinds of tats because he said, after a year or so, I remember thinking, I'm never going to survive this. Everybody I knew was dying. He's like, I had a good friend that got murdered. And... You know, and, and so he said, so it was the only, it's the only thing you have control over is in prison is like, you know, working out like your body. So he started tattooing himself to give himself, I guess, some kind of feeling of control or something. But he, he was absolutely right. And, and, you know, worrying about something that was out of my control, instead, it was just, he was like, you just have to kind of entertain yourself until it's over. And stop worrying about it because they'll, they'll tell you what to do. He says they're going to clothe you and they're going to feed you and they're going to house you. And he said they're going to tell you where to, when to do this and when to do that. He said you just have to follow the rules. Says, and I was like, okay. And you know, I'm like, okay. I remember thinking, you're, you're a guy with fucking horns tattooed on your head. I'm not listening to you. You're crazy. Because I remember just thinking everybody was a lunatic in there. And they were all complete idiots. And, but he was, he, man, he was absolutely right. He was absolutely right. You know, one of the things that every once in a while I'll do or I'll think, immediately kind of think, you know, kind of a, it's, it's kind of a, kind of a, you know, fuck you attitude. And it, it's just, it's basically, it's, it's kind of how I thought before I went into prison. And I just remember my buddy Pete, I have a buddy named Pete uh, Rossini, and he's still in prison. And he... You know, he, I put this, one time we were talking, there was a guy in prison that we used to hang out with, uh, and he was locked up for a Ponzi scheme. There's a bunch of Ponzi scheme guys in there. Oh God, they're always such scumbags too. Uh, and, and so this, so this guy was locked up and he was always running up debts. And then he was, he would lie and say, oh, you didn't get that. My, uh, my wife mailed that to you. You didn't get it. She said you should have it. Let me call my wife. Like he would keep people off and put them off and put them off and put them off. And I just remember looking at Pete one day and going, why does he, why does he do that? I mean, eventually he's going to get hurt. And Pete said, you know, he, Pete goes, Pete's been locked up 25 years. And he, he's like, look, I've seen guys leave and come back, leave and come back. And he said, he's coming back. He said, you know, you can't, he goes, what most people don't understand, Matt, is that you cannot come to prison and continue to behave the way you did prior to prison 
and then leave prison and expect not to return. So you just can't, you cannot behave in the same manner that got you into prison and expect to get out and never come back. And he goes, he's coming back. I mean, he's coming back. He's not learning anything. He denies everything that he's done. And he said he's, he's running up bills. He's lying to guys. He said, I mean, he's coming back. He goes, even if somehow or another he, he wins and gets out, his behavior is just so uh, egregious that he's, even in this situation, this is, you know, in prison's a situation where you run up a bill and you can't pay it and you spin someone and spin them and spin them and you could get hurt. And these guys aren't suing each other. These are not, these are not, you know, they, these are not uh, uh, doctors and CPAs, although there's a lot of doctors and CPAs in there. Um, but I'm saying, like, you don't have any recourse if somebody in prison fucks you over. You can't sue them. So, anyway. So, yeah, uh, one of the things I was thinking about was, and, and so anyway, that comes up, like, you know, a few times a week, I'll go to do something or think things, think even thinking something, and I'll stop myself and say, and that's the kind of shit that you would have done before you went to prison. That's the kind of thinking that got you locked up. You know, that's just not the way to behave. You're going to go back to prison. This is going to sound horrible, but if you get stabbed in prison, you probably had it coming. Like, it didn't randomly happen. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen. You know, but 99% of the time, you've done something to deserve what happened. Now, I'll give you an example. Like, you're a guy that, that gambles. These guys will run up gambling debts. They can't pay. And then what happens is the bookie comes to you and he says, listen, you owe like $500. You owe $1,500. You owe $1,000, whatever it may be. You got to pay. You, you're dodging me. It makes me look bad. And the guy, you know, typically they, they spin him and spin him. But at some point, the bookie's got to do something. And the guy, the degenerate gambler that's run up this bill, usually they'll, the bookie will go to him and say, look, you've got to check in, which means you've got to go to the lieutenant's office. And you have to tell him that you have to tell him that you owe money to somebody. Don't tell him it's me. Tell him you owe money, and you have to leave the compound. They'll put him. That person will go to the shoe, or what's called. It's basically it's the segregated housing or special housing unit or segregated housing unit. And it's 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 you know it's the hole. So they'll put you in the box. You know they call it the box. So they'll put you in the box. You'll stay there three to six months, and they'll ship you to another uh, to another location. But you can't stay here. You can't stay here because if the guy stays there and doesn't pay the bookie, he has to do something. He can't file a lawsuit. He can't put it on your credit. So he's got to do something. Otherwise, he, he's, everybody in the compound starts to look at him as a guy that you can run up debts on and you don't have to pay. It's not really about the money. It's that it looks bad. There's a big deal with respect in prison. And it's just, it looks bad. So. What happens is he'll go to him and say, look, you got to check in. And if the guy says, yeah, fuck you, I'm not going to check in. Well, then now what's he going to do? He's got to do something. And he's either going to go get a lock and they'll loop it around the belt and then tie it around their hand. They'll walk, and they'll walk up and just start hitting the guy in the head and he'll bleed and scream and holler and everybody knows. Uh, he owed him money. Or you, or you, they get a shank or something, and they go and they stab him. You know, and they're not even trying to kill him. They're just trying to let everybody know, look, I'm not the kind of guy that you can owe money to. And they'll stab him. And then, and it's so funny because like the first time I heard that somebody got stabbed, I remember I was like, somebody got stabbed. Like somebody died. And they're like, nah, they just stabbed him up a little bit. And I just remember thinking, where the, where the fuck, where am I? That stab him up a little bit. That that's not a, that's not a small thing. So. What happens is, is that they'll check in or they won't check in and the guy's got to do something or he does nothing and then everybody j basically just thinks, hey, this is the kind of guy I can run up debt, debt on. He won't do shit. And I've seen, I've seen that go so wrong. And there was a guy they called Truck. And Tr Truck was a little guy. He was like five foot two, five foot. He was smaller than me. And I remember Truck used to rent out urban novels. And so he would rent it out for whatever, uh, like a dollar, like a couple stamps. And so you rent it out for like a week, give it a week to read it, you return it. And I remember one time a guy, truck went to go get the book. And the guy was like, yeah, I lent it to somebody else. 
truck was like, well, what are you doing? He's like, yeah, I know I can't find the guy got shipped or he lost it or he lent it out. We can't find it. I don't know what to do truck. I'm sorry about that. So he's like, yeah, okay. Yeah, I understand. But you now you owe me like, like 10 or 20 bucks, whatever it cost. And the guy said, yeah, man, I, you know, I mean, I'm sure you got your, your, your money out of that book. And he's like, no, but it, you owe me the book. You, you got to pay, get me a, get me the book. And, and the guy was just like, man, you're making a big deal of this. Well, they get into an argument. The guy basically says, fuck you, truck. Go fuck yourself. He's, he's a five, five foot two, five foot three. This is a big guy. So truck goes, oh, okay. Truck goes back to his cell. He gets a lock and a belt and he comes back and he just starts swinging on the guy. I mean, he's just smashing him in the head over and over again. There's blood all over the cell. The guy was screaming. You could hear him screaming. He climbed over. This was in the low and we had a with what's called a, it's a cubicle system. So the walls of your cell go up about five feet. So this guy actually, he was cornered in the, in the cell and he actually ran and jumped on his locker and scurried up and jumped over the cell into the guy's, uh, into the guy's cell across from him. And uh, you know, it was, it was just, it was brutal and there was blood everywhere. And you know, I guess the life lesson is, you know, return your, your library books. You know, and I, I never had those types of problems. I don't, I don't gamble. I don't gamble. I don't talk about other people. And, you know, and I'm respectful to everybody. And I mouth off a few, well, I've mouthed off a few times, but it's all in good nature, fun. And, you know, but geez, that can go bad for you. I mean, there's like mental, the people have real mental problems. And there's, there are, there are just guys that have mental issues that are locked up. I mean, you'd be shocked how many people in federal prison have just major mental issues. And so, but I got, you know, I got lucky because I, I, I got, I, I, I immediately got in to when I got, went to the medium, I immediately started teaching real estate and, and that worked for me. I mean, it would really worked out. And you know what's funny about that? I actually had like Shawshank redemption type, uh, um, Shawshank Redemption type type of situations that happened. Like I remember one time I was at the medium, and it was about it was like nine o'clock at night. So they lock you down. You're locked down at like I forget. Like I think you're locked down at, at like eight or nine. Anyway, it was like nine o'clock at night, and so the compound's closed. Like there's everybody's locked up. The compound's completely empty, and so the CO comes in and says, Cox, Cox, and I'm like, yeah, what's up? And this was at the medium, it's like a real prison. It's not like a big room with a bunch of beds. This is like a real prison. And so he comes to my cell, he goes, Cox, come here. And I go, yeah, what's up? So he, I walk down and he goes, he opens the, the, the door, and he's got the keys, he's got the big old key, and he, and he goes, go down to building, you know, A building or whatever. There's somebody down there who wants to talk to you. And I said, Jesus, just walk down, there's a CEO waiting for you. I was like, uh, okay. So I walk down and I'm walking down and I, I, there's a, a, C, a couple of CEOs. So there's one CEO and a couple other came, come up, came up while I was there. I walk up and I'm like, yeah, well, what, what can I do for you? And he says, um, here's the deal. Uh, he said, there's a townhouse complex that it's on a golf course. He goes, now there's 50 townhouses. And he starts explaining the whole situation, how half of them are built, uh, they're selling off, they ran out of money, but these, these 25 are available. And so he starts explaining the whole thing to me. And, as, and I immediately go into uh, real estate investor mode. And so we sit there and have like a, a conversation couple other CEOs obviously uh, had come up and so they're talking and then they end up saying, well, if you were right now, what would you do? And this is in, just in the middle of the financial crisis, so maybe a couple of years, maybe 2000 and 2000, probably nine. And he, they're like, what, what would you do? I was like, right now, what would I would do? And I started going, I would do this and this and this. And we have this whole conversation and, and I, you know, I go back to the years like, man, I appreciate it. If you need anything, let me know. And I go, sure, no problem. And I go back. I walk upstairs and like everybody's looking at me. Like, what the fuck was that? And I'm like, I had a bunch of real estate questions. <laughs> and so it was just, it was comical. It reminded me of Andy Dufresne in Shawshank Redemption doing all the taxes for all of the, the uh, correctional officers. Okay. And so at some point I got moved and I remember finding out I was probably gonna get like, I was thinking I was gonna get like 12, uh, 10 to 12 years. I was going to end up getting 10 or 12 years. And at that point, they'd moved me to, I think it was in the, Mar it was the Marshall's Holdover in Union City. And 
I was in there with a guy who just done a bunch of time in the state for this guy was something else. This guy, I remember this guy told me he had stolen the identity of a of someone who had a a, a, a license to buy and sell firearms. So he was able to buy like automatic weapons or semi-automatic weapons, whatever. And he was in this guy's name. Had a driver's license. Had everything in his name. And he was buying these weapons and then driving them up to like New York and driving them in the states where you couldn't get those types of weapons. So he's buying a weapon for 800 bucks and selling it for $3,000. He's doing this. Well, eventually the, uh, uh, the ATF figures it out. They put a warrant out for his arrest. Uh, his car gets pulled over by a deputy, like a sheriff's deputy. I don't even, I don't even know what the circumstances are, why the deputy didn't call for backup or what. I don't remember. What I remember is he told me that he told me that the deputy pulled him out of the car or told him to get out of the car. I you know, need to search your, car, your vehicle. And he pulled a gun out and he started shooting at the deputy. So he's shooting at the deputy. The deputy's shooting back at him. They have a good old fashioned gunfight in the middle of the street. And they're shooting at each other back and forth. And he said he realizes that he's got to get in his car. He's got to get out of there. So he says... You know, I, I figure I'm, I'm, I'm outgunned. This guy's got a vest. He's, he's going to eventually, these cops are going to show up. So he said, I made the decision that I was just going to chase him until, I, in, until I, I killed him. And so he starts chasing him around the car, shooting at the deputy. He finally actually gets around the car and pulls the trigger. He's already shot him at it. Yeah, they've shot each other several times, at each other several times. He gets around the car, he pulls the trigger, and... The, the, he realizes that he, the slide had locked back. He'd already fired his last round. He said, that's when I, like, I pulled it. I realized I'm out of bullets. He, he said, I was out of bullets. He said, and the deputy was, you know, got, screamed and got on the ground. And the other cop cars show up and they grabbed me. And he said, and, uh, he said, and that was it. And then I, I, you know, I got charged and the whole thing. And I was like, what were you fucking thinking, bro? You're shooting at a cop? I mean, is it worth it? And he goes, he said, to be honest, he said, you want to know what the, what my thought was, he said, when I, he said, I only remember when I pulled that, when I got the drop on the cop and pulled the trigger, he said, I just remember thinking when it went, when I realized it, that it was empty, I remember thinking, damn, I almost had him. And it was just like, it was just, and these are the guys I'm surrounded by. And I just remember thinking, that's, fuck, this guy's ready to fucking kill somebody. I mean, not to mention the guys that, that I know that, that killed multiple people. It was that guy, so it was that guy that we were sitting there one day and I remember at that point I had found, I thought I, think I, th I, thought I was gonna get 10 or 12 years and I remember saying to him, I, I, I can't do 10 or 12 years. He said, I, I understand where you're, he said, I understand where your head's at. He goes, but you gotta understand, he said that at some point, you're going to get to where your, your final des your destination is after your sentence. You're going to go there. And you're going to surround yourself by people that are like-minded, people that you like, people you like being around. And he said, at some point in the future, he said, it won't be that bad. You'll, you'll have a good group of guys that you like hanging out with that are, that are decent guys. He said, you just got off the street. He said, your, your expectations of life are still up here. He said, you've got to lower your expectation. You're going to have to humble yourself. You're going to have to realize the situation you're in. He said, and you're also going to have to realize that you deserve to be in this situation. He says, you don't seem to realize that. And, and, I, and I, don't think I, I don't think I did realize that at the time. I think it was coming to terms with it. So he said, let me tell you a story. He said, I had been locked up a few years and I surrounded myself by a bunch of guys and he, t he said he was up north somewhere, I remember, because I remember t him saying they had, a, they had a barrel with firewood in it and they were burning, whatever, they were burning uh, the firewood and just to keep warm, he said it was so cold, we had like gloves on, like knitted gloves and bundled, we were all bundled up and he goes, we were, we, me and a bunch of guys, we were playing Risk. And, he's, and Risk, you know, it takes a long time. I didn't even know what Risk was. I was like, Risk? He goes, yeah, it's a board game, bro. It's fucking amazing. He was going on and on about Risk. So he tells me they were playing Risk. And they'd been playing it for a couple days. He goes, man, he said there was a guy that was bringing us like hot chocolate and, and uh, uh, 
coffee and we were we were warming our hands and we we're playing risk and and he said you know he said you got you got to understand risk you don't know you don't understand i know but he said so one guy had invaded another guy's territory he was and we're yelling at each other and like they it was they they were they were screaming at, you know we're rolling dice and and he said man it was just it was so much fun and and we were laughing so hard and and he said you know these were like these were my buddies you know and they were good guys and and he said, you know, he said, and I remember thinking at that moment, he said, there was no place I would rather be and nobody else I would rather be with right now. This is the best. This is amazing. He goes, and you don't think it now, but you're going to have those times in your life. He was in prison. And I remember thinking, this fucking guy... This guy's crazy. This guy's got a, this guy had a shaved head, tattoos on his head, um, tats all over his neck, an Aryan Brotherhood looking fucking maniac. And he said, he goes, you're going to have those times. You're going to, he said, and, and I said, you're, bro, you're crazy. I said, That's never, That's never going to happen. I remember thinking, this guy's a fucking idiot. What do you know? You don't know anything. You don't know me. And so you got to fast forward five years. I've been sentenced. I got an outdate 2030. I'm at Coleman Low. I'd already gone to the medium and came out of the medium and I was in the low. And I remember I was with my buddy, Donnie Shackelford, uh, Nico. Hernandez was a buddy of mine, uh, a, guy named, uh, a guy named Paul and a guy named Ron. Remember we used to call him Ron Paul. Uh, they were all, always hung out together. And uh, I don't think it was, uh, there was a guy we called Doc because he was a pulmonary specialist. He was actually a doctor. Uh, he was locked up. His name was, um, his last name was, was Carter. It was, uh, it was uh, Christopher Carter. Anyway, I don't, he wasn't there. So, uh, so, but it was like I hung out with these guys all the time and we were playing Risk. So now I'm playing Risk all the time. So I, I, now I know what risk is and it's a game that these guys play. And, and so you would literally, you'd start the game. You could play that game for three, four days. So, and, and you would have to check out the game and then you'd have to, when you had to put the game back, like we would all write down what, uh, what countries we had occupied and how many people we had. And you had, you had, a, a, you had like a gatekeeper, the guy that kept those books and came out and got the game. Like it, was, it was a whole production. And I remember we're sitting there and Donnie and I want to say it was Donnie and like one of the Rons, they they had a, a, a they had a non-aggression pact, and it, like Donnie wasn't supposed to invade uh, like one of the like Ron's country or Paul whoever it was, and he had gotten to the point where he had amassed like a, a huge amount of of uh, of soldiers and he would and he just invaded the guy like out of the blue he's like man i gotta go in he's like what the fuck are you talking about like they start screaming at each other but they're laughing and i remember we had a soda guy because we're all in florida so it's hot so we had a, a soda guy bringing us ice cold sodas and he's bringing us hot dogs and we're there for hours and and donnie and ron are yelling at each other and there were we're all laughing and laughing and then we were like uh, you know and, I, you know, he, he, he's like, you scumbag. He's like, fuck you. Like, they're screaming at each other. And, and I just remember thinking, wow, this is amazing. You know, these, these are great guys. This is, this is great. I'm having a blast. This is so much fun. And, and I remember thinking, man, there's like nowhere, nowhere I'd rather be right now. And... I, I was in the middle of prison at the beginning of a 20 some odd year sentence with no hope of getting out. And I remember thinking, I wished I knew the name of the guy that had told me that these types of situations were going to happen so that I could send him a letter or tell him he was 100% right. He's 100% right. He, uh, I mean, he absolutely had, had, 
he had it down because I had numerous moments like that. You know, you, you have them sometimes in life where you realize, wow, this is, this is amazing. This is like, this is what it's, this is what it's about. And, and although listening to this, you probably think, oh, that's crazy. You're just playing risk. I don't, you got to understand that, that your expectations of life have, have lowered so much that you take, you take joy in, in anything. And, and that was, that was great. And those were great guys. And, and I remember Donnie was locked up. Donnie was brilliant. Donnie Shackelford was locked up for running an LSD lab in St. Bart's. I think it was St. Bart's or St. Martin. I don't know. I'm no good at geography. I, I, I don't even think I could name all the states. So what happened was uh, Donnie actually ran, actually ran an LSD lab in like, let's say St. Bart's or St. Martin, I forget, and would ship the LSD back to the United States. And he had a group of girls that he called the angels. I want to say it was like four or five of them that would go around and follow the Grateful Dead and sell LSD at Grateful Dead concerts. When they caught Donnie, I want to say they said he had $10 million worth of uh, uh, worth of LSD. Now he he said that what they did was they took the product, like the the precursor materials that he had to make the LSD, and they were calculating that. And the paper was absolutely wrong. And ten million, that's ridiculous. It wasn't that much. So, uh, but he uh, he was he was a brilliant guy. Brilliant guy. Good times. Good times. So when I was in the medium, so I was at the medium, and for the first year or two, I would I would hang out in the. Uh, I would, I would hang out in the art room or the, sorry, the paint room or paint studio, whatever you want to call it. So I would hang out there and, and there was a guy there by the name of Ron. Uh, they called him Old Man Ron. He was probably 70 years old. Super nice guy. Always really polite to me. Always really nice. And always ready to help me. Like, uh, you know, lend you paint or whatever you wanted. I mean, he's just, a, just like a super helpful, nice old guy. I just always remember thinking, you know, what the fuck? This poor guy, he's like gonna die in prison. Like he, he was just finishing his federal sentence and he still had to go to the state and do, and do time. Uh, and I remember, just remember thinking, what's gonna happen to this poor guy? So there was a guy named DiGeronimo that worked, uh, that, there was a guy named D. Geronimo that also painted, amazing artist. And I remember him coming to me one day and he said, you know, I, I see you hanging out with Ron all the time. And I was like, yeah, he's all right. He's all right. He goes, no, Ron's a good guy. I like Ron a lot. He said, you know, I said, yeah, I just can't believe. I said, he's got, got he's got, he's still got to go to the state. He goes, I know, I know. Uh, he said, he's, he's a good guy, Cox. He's, I mean, he's always been very polite to me and very nice and helpful. He's a nice guy. I was like, right. he goes, he's like I think you kind of feel bad for old Ron. I go, I do feel bad for him. He's probably going to die in prison. He goes, yeah, he is. He said, he said he probably is. He said, but I, I want to mention something. And this is the thing. I wish to God I knew what Ron's name was. He said, Ron was in like a motorcycle gang. He was in, Ron had actually was like an enforcer for the motorcycle gang. And I went, okay. And I forget if it was the, uh, it was the outlaws. Anyway, so he said Ron had actually gone to trial like twice in the state of Florida and beat both cases. And I was like, okay. And he, and he was like, he said, but he didn't beat him because he was innocent. He said, just beat him. And I was like, all right. And he said, you know, people don't show up. Witnesses don't show up. And I said, all right. And he goes, and so DiGeronimo said, the last one that he beat, he said, Ron had been arrested. He, he goes, Ron had murdered somebody. And there were four wit witnesses. I don't know if there was four or six, whatever. I'm going to say four. He goes, there was, there was a bunch of witnesses. He goes, there was like four witnesses. He goes, so Ron got arrested. And Ron knew he was going to lose at trial. He said, well, about 10 days before the trial, they give you the witness list in the state of Florida. This was back in the 70s, by the way. He said, so they got the witness list. This is in the late 70s. He goes, so he got the witness list. And he said, Ron was on a work detail in, the, uh, in where they were holding him. They're holding him. They hold these guys in like a county jail state of Florida. So he goes, he was on a work detail. And this is something that probably would never happen now. So he was on a, he was on work detail and he said, so Ron walked away. Somebody picked him up in a car. He took off. He said, almost a year later, Ron showed back up at the county jail. 
and said, hey, I'm here, uh, ready to go to trial. Well, what happened was then the, uh, the district attorney went and started to put, said, okay, well, great, we're going to charge you with escape now, and we're going to get you for, these, for this murder. And he started to go out and get the witnesses so he could put everybody back together and, and go f move forward on the, uh, with the trial. And he found out that all four witnesses had, had died. Uh, like two disappeared and two were just murdered, like gunshot to the head murder. And I remember DiGeronimo said, like the day after the last guy was killed, Ron walked in and said, hey, I'm here, I'm ready to, uh, ready to go to trial. And so DiGeronimo said, so, you know, he was, and I know what you're thinking, Cox, you, you, you're probably thinking like those people had it coming and that's not what I was thinking. He said, but you know, you got to understand, he said, you know, these, he said two of those people were women. He was, all they were was decent citizens who'd witnessed a murder. And he said, and as a result of that, he said he, 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 was, he, he hunted all four of them down and murdered them. Now, of course, so the district attorney obviously had to drop that the case and they, it's months later, it took them months before they finally just dropped the case. So they dropped the case and Ron walked out and then the feds came and picked him up for something else like a year or two later they got him for something and he got, he ended up getting a bunch of federal time and still had to go and do some state time for something. So I just remember thinking, you know, these are, he, you know, these are the guys I'm surrounded with. And DiGeronimo said, he said, so I know he's a nice guy and you feel bad for him. He said, but you don't have to feel bad for him. He said, he deserves to be in prison. He said he should probably die in prison. And he said, so don't, don't feel too bad for him. And he said, and, and just know when you're talking to him, he said that he would kill you for a pack of cigarettes. It was a couple of weeks, I do remember this. It was so fucking horrible. I have a really dark sense of humor. So a couple weeks later, I remember that Ron had put a bunch of, of canvases like up on the lockers and he wasn't supposed to do that. Like he'd hid them behind some other big painting. And, and the woman that ran, this correctional officer that ran that, the, the painting room had told him not to do it. So she saw them and she started yelling at him. And she said, I told you this and I told you not, I meditate, you want to get a shot and you, you're going to get a, you know, it's shot as a disciplinary action, you know, and you're going to lose game time. She's screaming at him and he's sitting there. And all of a sudden I remember everybody's quiet listening to this, her scream at him and say she's going to take his painting privileges and she's going to throw the paintings away. And who do you think you are, old man? And she's just being an asshole. And Ron starts laughing. And so he just, uh, he starts you know, he just starts laughing. She's like, what are you laughing at? And he's like, I'm so, so I'm sorry, ma'am. You're right. You're right. But he, kept, he couldn't stop laughing. You could tell something was funny. She got frustrated and, and left. And then he said, Cox, can you help me get these paintings down? So I'm, I'm helping him get the paintings down. And I said to him, I said, uh, uh, what were you laughing about, bro? What was so funny? And I remember he, he looked at me, he goes, he said, I remember thinking to myself, if you talk to me like this on the street, I cut your fucking head off and drive around with it in the trunk of my car for a couple of days. He goes, but I'm not on the street. I'm in prison and I just have to take it. He goes, and I don't know why, but that made me laugh. He said, I thought that was funny. He said, I don't know why it popped in my head. And I was like, <laughs> I mean, this is, these are just the guys. These are the guys that you're hanging out with. I used to eat with a guy that, I used to eat with a guy that probably, he had a life sentence and he had, he killed something like, God, like 20 or 30 people for the, uh, the Sinaloa cartel. And the feds got him. And I used to eat, I used to eat lunch with him all the time. Super nice guy. He was the, uh, he, uh, he worked in the, uh, in the chapel. I you know, I've met these guys. It's like, I, they'll, they'll have done 20, they'll have done 20 or 30 years or, you know, my buddy Pete, 25 years. He did 25 years for, uh, conspiracy to murder two uh, FBI informants. Says he does didn't do it. And I remember we were walking one day, and I was, I, we were. He said something to me, and he made some crack about. He said, "Boy, you're a, he says, boy, you're a scumbag." He said, "I feel like one of your victims." And I was, I go, "My victims? I go, my victims are alive." And he looked at me, he goes, and he sat there and he, go, he looked at me and he goes, he said, I'm innocent. I didn't do it. I 
they start laughing. They were walking around laughing. He goes, you saw the reports. You saw this. Because I wrote a book on him called, uh, called um, Devil Exposed. He's like, you've seen the, the reports. You've seen everything. I said, listen, Pete. I said, I, I don't care. I said, look, I said, if you did it, if you didn't do it, I said, you're my friend and I like you and it doesn't matter. And he's like, and so he would get so pissed off and he'd start screaming at me and yelling. He's a super smart guy. Pete was, Pete is, Pete is brilliant, brilliant. He's one of those guys that, guys, probably got 180 IQ and he's just, and yet he, can't follow directions. It's like Frank Amadeo. He's super brilliant, amazing attorney, amazing legal mind, and he, he can't open a bag of potato chips. I mean, like, he, he, like he'll, he, he, you could see him and he'll, and he just gets frustrated and he, and, you, and you, you're looking at him thinking, calm, calm down. Like it, it literally, it's, it is a major task for him to open potato chips. And, and yet, brilliant. Pete's the same way. You know, difficulty talking to people, uh, socially awkward, it, and, and yet once you, you meet him and warm up to him, amazing guy, amazing guy. And that, listen, that's basically it. Those are some quick stories and that's just kind of some of the stuff like, I guess, <laughs> the prison wisdom. Uh, and that, that's where I'm at, uh, that's, that's basically it. So <clears throat> do me a favor and subscribe, hit the button, hit like, hit the bell, share the video, watch it a couple of times, do the whole thing. I got a bunch of books. I've got Shark in the Housing Pool, which is my book. I have uh, Pete's book, Devil Exposed. I've got, uh, I just finished Amadeo's book. I have an audio book for my book. Um, I'm going to have an audio book for the program. I'm, there's a bunch of, uh, I'm getting uh, Frank Amadeo's book, which is called Instant Sanity. I'm getting that turned into an audio book. So they'll all be on Audible also. They're all available on uh, Amazon, except for Amadeo's book, which is, it's insanity. It will be. So I have merchandise and that's pretty much it. So see ya.